you know, it's a, the first colloquium of the, of the spring quarter, and we got it's going off with a bang because we have uh, the Reese lectures, both Reese lectures given by Professor from MIT, and today she will talk about two different topics. But let me just mention a couple of things. I mean, she's uh, um, at MIT. She's oh, I have to read that that name. I can't remember, but she's the she's the Neil and Jane Papalardo Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and she's also in the math department. But that doesn't mean she's a mathematician or a mechanical engineer because she has degrees in physics. So depending on what people do, <laughs> she talks one way or the other. Um, anyway, but you know, she has a lot of accomplishments. Let me just sort of give background. And she's a fellow of the APS in fluid in the fluid dynamics division. Makes a lot of sense given the, the context. And she's also um, got from SIAM the uh, IE Block Community Lecture Prize, which is a uh, lecture, which is, um, I don't read that because I didn't know about that prize, but it sounds very good. Um, so these lectures should reach out to, as broadly as possible to students, teachers, and members of the local community, as well as design members, researchers, and practitioners in fields related to applied and computational mathematics. And that's actually what I think will happen tomorrow, because I've heard a version of the talk she's talking about tomorrow, which, anyway, so I, I definitely recommend that you could come tomorrow again. Uh, she also received the Stanley Corson Award of the APS for significance and impact in fluid dynamics. And so let me not waste her time. Uh, she, her research is as we respect fluid dynamics and bio-inspired design, and also sports technology and sports data statistics. That's going to be tomorrow. Okay, but thanks for being here. And, uh, Thank, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, yeah, so um, um, so uh, uh, it, as said in the introduction, tomorrow is going to be sports, um, and today is bio-inspired design. Um, so actually, let me ask, how many people here have taken a fluid mechanics class? Okay, I'm going to say a quarter. <laughs> so, all right, so I'm going I'm to teach you some fluid mechanics today then. Um, all right, so, uh, but let me start, um, let me start by, oh, Yes. Um, hmm, here we go. Okay, so let me start by just saying a few words about filtration. Um, so filtration is everywhere. Like this building that we're in presumably has an air handling system and there's filters in that air handling system. And the amount of power that this building is consuming, um, part of that depends on how good these filters are, right? How much, how much the power the air handling system has to consume in order to push things through the um, through whatever is processing the air. So, um, so the filters are everywhere. This is a commercial HVAC system. So this is an inhaler. That is the Deer Island water treatment plant off the coast of Massachusetts. So this is where Cambridge and Boston get all of their water. And again, everything in here has to go through filters. So these are huge systems. They're all over. You see them all over the place. And um, um, uh, as you heard in the introduction, we're interested in bio-inspired design. And so one of the things we like to look at is to think about, um, are there systems in nature that do the thing that we're trying to accomplish? Um, and can we learn something from the strategies that they have, uh, they have evolved? Um, and the idea behind that is that because these natural systems have evolved for millions of years, um, if they're trying to do something that we are also trying to do, they may have come upon um, efficient or um, uh, effective ways to do the thing that we're trying to do as engineers. Um, okay, so um, so the first thing to do is to look and see what if there's biological systems that filter, and um, as you can imagine, there are. So um, this is a very complicated looking plot, um, uh, but the, the message I need you to take away from it um, is that there are a lot of things that filter. Um, so, um, so since this is, um, I'm going to tell you more about fluid mechanics later, but um, if you're not familiar with, with fluid mechanics, you can just say, that I, I put this on some two-dimensional space. I could have given you just a list, that would have been fine. Um, this, what, this axis here is a Peclet number, which tells you something about the ratio of convection to diffusion. We'll talk about that later. This tells you something about how big the particle is that you're trying to filter out versus whatever the fibers are in your filter. That's also something that's well known in the filtration literature. Um, but what you need to take away from here is there's a lot of words on this plot and they're all names of things like whale shark and pulsing coral and copepods, right? So these are all things that in nature that filter and the ones that are in red these are the things, um, these are industrial systems that filter. Um, and so the thing that, that, that's great news about this plot is there are a lot of biological systems that filter and they operate in the same kind of parameter regimes that the industrial filters work in. So that seems very promising. Maybe they're doing something that could be useful. Okay, that's the good news. The good news, lots of things on this plot. Here's the bad news. The bad news uh, is that they all do the same thing. Okay, and here's what they do. 
uh, they do this. Right. That's basically what a filter does, right? You have some kind of a mesh and particles get caught in that, in that mesh. Um, and, um, and the problem with filtering this way is um, that everything that doesn't go through the mesh gets stuck on the mesh, right? So you end up with something called fouling. And so all your filters end up looking like this. And then there's a huge amount of effort that goes into cleaning these filters or figuring out how to replace the filters. Um, and so in every industry, this is a problem, the fouling on the filters. Um, okay, so, um, so I said every, every animal in here does this. And I should have said every animal with the exception of one. And because you've seen the title of the talk, you know what that animal is. Um, and the one animal that is the exception to this is uh, the manta ray. Okay, so, um, so these are manta rays. Um, that's a diver up there. So you can see that they're, they're pretty big animals. Um, these are their filter feeders. Um, and in a minute, you're, this is gonna show the filter feeding behavior of, this is the filter feeding behavior. They do these big arcs where they suck in a bunch of fluid. And so particles come in the mouth and then filtered water comes out the gills, right? So the particles all go into the stomach and the, wa the filtered water comes through the, the gills and which is how they breathe. Um, so um, this is something that's been studied by, by many, I mean, biologists have studied everything about animals. Um, so here's another photo so you can see kind of what's going on. So the white, the white things inside there, those little triangle things, that's the structure. That, those are basically bones or cartilage. So that's the thing that's holding this thing open. And the black between there, that's the filter, okay? And so the, the, this filtering stuff comes through the filter and then out the gills down here. Um, and I'm not gonna show you what that black area looks like. Um, so the black area looks something like this. So it's made up of a bunch of tiny little stacked plates. Okay, so this here, these are a bunch of tiny little stacked plates. That's a photo of what's, what's going on in there. Um, and again, biologists have studied this as as much as you want to study it, especially, so, so um, there is one uh, woman, uh, Misty Peg Tran, I do not know her, but she has written incredible papers in this, in this field. So if you want to know anything about these manta rays, um, Misty has done this. Um, and so here are some micrographs of what those actually little filters think, filter things look like. And here's um, some sketches of what they look like for a couple of different organisms. And one of the things that I want to draw your attention to here is that if you look at these sketches, this length scale is basically the same in all of these filters, right? So they're all a few millimeters, right? Um, and this is interesting because if you compare that to the size of the mantas, the mantas actually span, if you, if you just look at adults, they probably span about an order of magnitude of how big they are. And if you look at juveniles, it's probably two orders of magnitude, right? So the actual animal um, varies a lot in size, but these filter sy uh, systems all look the same, okay? Um, so, we're gonna think a little bit about, uh, about why those filters might all look the same. Um, uh, but first, let me tell you that, again, this group, uh, Misty's group, um, she proposed that what they're doing, uh, what this filter is doing is something that she calls uh, a ricochet separation. Um, and the idea is that, so if this now picture is looking at these guys from the side, so each one of these is one of those little plates and the fluid is flowing that way, so the mouth is over there. And the red trajectories are trajectories of particles, which you can see kind of bounce off the top of these things, and then the clear water flows out this way. Okay. So that's the that's the, the strategy that we think is happening, or that the biologists have proposed happening. Um, and um, so this is something that um, they they refer to as cross-flow filtration. So cross-flow meaning versus dead. So this is dead end sieving. This is what I told you is bad. That's what you get, that's what happens when you are fouling. And they're think they're now proposing, okay, we should do something with cross flow. Um, okay, and um, and they did some nice simulations. So here's a nice simulation. Um, let's see if I can get that to play. So this is one, this is not ours, this is one of their simulations. And so the idea is that you've got these little particles that bounce off the top of these and then um, go down into the stomach of the manta. Okay. All right, so. That's what people knew before we started thinking about this. Um, and so we started thinking about, okay, well, um, let's say I wanted to make something like this for Deer Island, um, or I wanted to design this for a particular filtering application. How would I wanna design all of these little platelets to get them to do whatever I need them to do? Okay, so, um, so the rest of this talk is gonna be talking about um, building this mathematical model. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna talk about uh, building a Manta model. Um, so here's my Manta model. This is my Manta. Um, this is an applied math department, so um, my manta is a cylinder, I expect. <laughs> uh, and in fact, it is, uh, it's going to be a leaky cylinder. So 
I'm going to have flow that's coming in on the mouth end over here, and then it's going to leak out the gills over here. Okay, And this leaky cylinder, so what's coming out the gills, this is going to be what I want. I want to design this so that I have clear fluid co coming out the gills. Um, and then I have delicious plankton going to the, the back end of the cylinder. Okay, So that's the, that's the picture. Um, and um, now we're going to do some fluid mechanics which I now know only, so the quarter of you that have had the fluid mechanics class, this will be a review. The rest of you will learn some fluid mechanics. Um, okay, so here's my leaky cylinder. So I'm gonna draw my leaky cylinder like this. Um, I'm actually not gonna do it in cylindrical coordinates just because it, we don't need that extra complexity to understand the physical mechanisms driving this. So I'm just gonna do a 2D, I'm gonna do this all in 2D just so you can see how everything comes out. Um, so this is the, my 2D cylinder. This is my leaky boundary and the leaky boundary has some permeability K and that K, tells you sort of how hard is it to push fluid through these through this boundary. Okay, Q leak, this is my volume flux of fluid that leaks out the side. Um, these are my material properties of the fluid, and this is sort of the scale of my, of my cylinder. Okay, um, and the first thing I'm gonna ask is let's just think about what is the mechanism that's actually doing this sorting, that's getting the, that's sending big particles to the back and letting clear fluid out the, out the sides. And you can go in and you can do, you can do a literature study. Um, uh, and if you do that little search, I'm going to zoom in on one of those, that little red square that appeared. I'm going to zoom in on one of these little holes. Um, and in that little hole, so it, there's lots of ways you can model this. But it, again, there's people who have simulated this. Um, and typically, you might have something like there where you have a pipe and you've got a bunch of stuff leaking outside. And you can draw these kinds of streamlines of where particles go. And, um, and what you see is that in all of these simulations, there's some critical streamline, which I've drawn by that red line. And if you're below that red line, you go out through the little, the little pore. And if you're above the red line, you go down the center of the channel to the stock. Okay. Um, and so now you can start to think about, okay, this is, this is how it's going to do the size sorting, right? Because if I imagine I'm, a, I'm some particle, um, if I am the green particle, um, I can make it past that little sticky-outy thing and get into the pore. Right, but if I'm the purple particle, the purple particle, that purple streamline is the, one of the ones that's above this critical streamline, so they go down the thing, and so it can't make it around that corner, so it doesn't get down into the into the pore. So it's going to get sent down the down to the stomach. Okay. So the interesting thing about this, from the from the um, perspective of filtration, is that there is a parameter which is called the selectivity. Okay, and the selectivity. Um, is the ratio between the cutoff particle diameter. So the cutoff particle diameter is the, um, the largest particle that can make it into that, into that pore, right? So in this case, it's the red one. Right? So the red one, it's the largest particle that can make it into that pore. Anything bigger than that is going to go down. Um, the ratio of this to the pore diameter, right? And as you've seen in here, this number could actually be much less than one. Right, so other, unlike sieving filtering, where I'm just pouring stuff through the holes, the, the size of the hole dictates how big the particle is. In this case, the fluid mechanics is actually doing something where you can filter out particles that are much smaller than the size of the pores, which means that you don't get this clogging phenomenon. So ideally what we want um, is we want something where my selectivity is very, very small. Right, that's my objective, is I want to build a system where my, my selectivity is very small. Okay. So now uh, let's do some fluid mechanics. Um, so um, so uh, let, me, let me now connect selectivity to other fluid parameters in the problem. Um, so, um, uh, so what I've drawn here is a velocity profile. And the velocity profile tells you how fast is, is a particle moving any place in this, in this channel. So if I have a particle here, it's moving very fast. If I have a particle near the wall, it's moving very slow. That's slow, that's fast. And, um, and this is a typical parabolic flow profile that you would get if you have laminar flow. Um, there are lots of different kinds of flows. This is kind of the easiest one you can do. I'm going to do the easiest one first, and I'm, then I'm going to show you that we can do it with all different kinds of compl complex flow profiles. But for now, um, let's suppose we have a laminar parabolic flow profile. Um, and in that flow profile, um, I can draw kind of roughly where that critical, um, that critical streamline is. So let's say my critical streamline is about this far away from the, from the wall. Okay. Um, and if I do that, um, that critical streamline sets the maximum particle radius that I can filter out. So that the distance from the wall, that's our critical. That's my critical size. Okay, and now I'm just going to do some math. Okay, and I'm going to say, all right, um, I want to know uh, what fraction of my flow can I filter out um, as a function of the size of the particle that I want to filter. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to write that down. So this thing, this this here, just tells you 
I know there's a math audience, so I know you were waiting for some equations. <laughs> equations. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this guy over here, this is the fluid equation that gives you the balance between the pressure gradient and the velocity field. U is the velocity field, you, uh, P is the pressure, and U is the viscosity of some parameter in the problem. Um, you can solve that, you integrate it twice. Um, you get this parabolic flow profile, so that's this shape, that's the parabola. Okay, so, um, and now that I have the parabola, I can just integrate over this chunk to get how much is coming out the sides, because anything in this chunk goes out the sides and, and, and compare it to how much is going down the middle. Okay, so we do that. You do some math, and, um, and you find the following. So you find that the fraction of fluid that is leaking out the side, that's this, um, is proportional to the cutoff particle diameter squared. Um, and now you can see that we have a problem. Okay, and here's the problem that we have. The problem is that um, a minute ago I told you um, what, I, what I would like is I would like this number to be very small, right? Because I want to have that ratio. I want to be filtering out really tiny particles with big pores, right? If I'm going to do this on Deer Island, I also need a bunch of through, a high throughput because I have to be able to process a lot of water, which means I want this, this, this filtered water to be really, really big. So I need this number to be really big and this number to be really small. And this is just the ratio of that size to that size. So that doesn't help me, right? So, so, I have, so there's an inherent trade-off in using this strategy for filtration, right? You have to make a choice about, am I, am I more concerned about throughput or am I more concerned about filtration? Yeah. What's yeah. D? Oh, D, yeah. So D, D is, uh, thank you, um, this, the, the size of this pore here. So it's gonna be typically really tiny. Really tiny, yeah, and thank you for that question because we're gonna get, in a minute, we're gonna think about how we design these. So we're gonna think about parameters um, like this width, this height, and if you wanted to, also the angle, yeah. So we, so we can absolutely put that in. This will give you sort of the rough scaling, yeah. And the, so then the factor in the parentheses is the, um, uh, the particle diameter over the height. Correct, it, exactly, exactly, yeah. So this is, this is, this is the poor, okay, poor diameter, over height of channel, and this is the selectivity, which is the particle diameter over the pore diameter. So, so it's independent of the pore diameter. Independent of the pore diameter, correct. Yeah, pore diameter cancels out. Yeah, perfect. Great. Great. Also very interesting that it's independent of the pore diameter. Good. Hold that thought. <laughs> it's great. Okay, so, um, all right, so the next thing you might say is, well, you know, Paco, you picked this very specific profile, like laminar flow. That's this is this is like not most flows are not laminar. Most flows are turbulent in, in filtration, and that's fine. So we can also put in another shape of this profile. Um, so if you think about turbulent flow or inviscid flow, what this what this becomes is instead of parabola, it's just a constant. So it looks constant across here. Um, so you do better, right? So if you make this constant, you get instead of cut just have this green area, you have a little green box. Right, so you kind of double how much is coming out there, but you still get the same scaling, right? So we can do this both for an inviscid flow or for a viscous flow. Um, and what you find, um, I'm now just gonna plot this, right? Everybody can plot this. I'm gonna plot Q lead versus uh, beta squared. And, um, and you get this, right? So there's Q lead, that's what we just computed versus beta squared. This is the viscous flow profile, so that's the parabola. This is if you do it for an inviscid flow profile. Again, you can do everything analytically, so that's totally fine. And um, uh, this is, again, I want to be down here for my selectivity, and I want to be up there for my high, high throughput. So ideally, I'd want to be in that upper left-hand corner, which I can't get to. Okay, so, um, so this is all uh, not accessible. So, so in a minute, we're going to talk about where the manta, how the manta might want to navigate this and where it wants to sit. Um, but first, we're going to check if this is right. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, so my, my student, Jin Yu, um, who, uh, who did all of the work I'm going to show you today, said, well, th this is a, a, 2D, a 2D estimate, but let's just do the 2D numerical calculation. Um, so, uh, so he pulled out ANSYS, so we can do turbulent, bits. we can do any kind of flows you want. Um, and, um, and he just did, this is his, his ANSYS manta, so the middle, the mouth is over here. That's the inner workings of the manta, and this is the filter that's coming out that way. Okay. Um, and uh, he just for you can put in whatever parameter regimes you want, and you can say, okay, I'm going to zoom in on on that little red box there, and you can calculate the pressure profiles, you can calculate the streamlines, you can calculate whatever you want. You can put in like different spacings, you can put in different lengths, you can put in different flow velocities, all these kinds of things. 
Um, and he just ran this. Uh, oh, actually, I should say this because this is going to be important. Um, so it, moving forward, um, whenever I talk about the poor, I'm talking about this little guy over here. And when I'm talking about the channel, I'm talking about that thing up there that's connected to the mantis mouth. OK, so that's the terminology I'll use. Um, OK, so he he ran this on a bunch of different things and he varied um, uh, th different things like the length of these guys, D, the distance between them, T is the periodicity on this, U is the channel velocity, the channel height. You can just, you just sweep through all of these guys and, um, uh, and different Reynolds numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and you found this. So those boundaries are real. They're real, right? I mean, this is, even though that, even though that, that calculation was super simple, like it wasn't even one line of mathematics. It's like one, but, but you get that, just by doing that very, very simple calculation, you already see what are the constraints on this, on this problem. Okay, um, and so each one of these plots is one of those ANSYS simulations, and then he's run it for different Reynolds numbers, he's run it for different pore widths. You can see these are the, the small pores down here, which is, you would expect small pores get you better selectivity. Those are the big pores. This is the, this is the low Reynolds number up here for those of you who are, have taken fluid mechanics class. This is low Reynolds number. High Reynolds number are the ones towards the top there. Right, so it's kind of sorted out the way you might expect it. Um, um, and, and like I said, the, the boundaries are real. Okay, so those are, those are our constraints. Um, so next you ask, all right, fine. If those are my constraints, <laughs> as a manta, what do I want to do? Okay, so here's what the manta wants. So let's think about what the manta wants. Um, the first thing that the manta wants um, is uh, the manta needs to eat. Okay, and what the manta eats is they eat plankton. Um, and so this is a bunch of different plankton. And each of these scale bars is 20 microns. So you can see this guy here is, I don't know, maybe 100 microns, a little over 100 microns. That guy there is maybe a couple hundred microns. So that one's maybe 50. So you can see that plankton sits in this size range that's usually about a couple hundred microns. Okay. So, um, so if I think about that in terms of this plot, um, that's the plankton range. See my plankton. I don't know if I can move this bar so you can see it. I can't move that bar, but that says plankton up there. <laughs> up there. So this range here is where is where plankton sits. Okay, so ideally, ideally we would want to sit somewhere, somewhere in this. Oh, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you remind me the size of the pores in the manta? Yes. Yeah, so the size of the pores are um, the plates are about five millimeters, a few millimeters, millimeters, and the gap is probably closer to about a millimeter. Yeah. So a factor of ten bigger than plankton. Good question. You've already jumped to my final slide. <laughs> okay. So so this is plankton. So I cut. So so this is um, again. This is the cutoff particle diameter. So you want to sit somewhere in there. Okay. The other thing that the manta wants to do. Um, is uh, the manta needs to breathe, right? So that water that's coming through the gills, that's where they're pulling out oxygen. So you need a minimum amount of, oxygen, of water flowing through there to get the oxygen, uh, which means that um, you have to be above this green, uh, this green box, otherwise they suffocate, okay? All right, so that means um, that I now have, I'm holding in on what the manta actually wants. So that means that the manta needs to sit somewhere in this little blue box, okay? And now I have defined the math question that I have to answer. Okay. The question that I have to answer is I have to say, okay, um, if I am a manta that is evolving these structures to some kind of size scale, um, how do I pick the geometry of this structure such that my Q leak, the volume of leakage is within this blue box, right? Okay, so everything moving forward is gonna be about how do I predict Q leak given the other interesting pieces of this problem. Okay, once I know Q leak, then I can start to dial those parameters and say that's where the manta wants to sit. Okay, good? Yeah. You would imagine that they could also be trying to op to uh, maximize the, the amount of particles that they are getting. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. And so- Is that the same thing as maximizing Q leak? Uh, it's different. Ah, ah, yeah, very, really good question. So this is so this is different. Let's see. So what if I want to put in? Uh, let me go back just just to show this the picture because this is this is actually super important. So the the difference between a, the, a filtration system that we would build for one of these buildings is actually kind of the inverse of what the manta wants right, to yeah, do, yeah. right? Um, so I'm glad you asked this question. So Q leak 
if I'm gonna if I'm gonna build a filtration system for this building, I want to maximize what's coming through here, right? The amount of particles that the manta is getting are the ones that are going through here. Right, and so ideally what you would like is you would like a lot of fresh stuff going through here, but you want all of those particles that are in the delicious size range to be bounced off in that way, right? So, and ideally also the manta doesn't want a lot of salt water going that way. It wants the salt water to come this way and just the particles to go that way. Yeah, that's good. Good, everybody good on that? Good, okay, so let's see. Um, over here. So here's my manta. All right, so this is this is the question we're gonna think about is how do I design those pads in order for Q leak to be in that blue box? Okay, so um, so let me go back to the leaky pipe. So here's the leaky pipe I had before, and now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on this little chunk, and I'm gonna now introduce a new parameter. So L is the thickness of my of my little chunk there. Okay, and um, I'm now going to um, derive the differential equations I need to solve in order to make this work. So uh, the first is I'm going to draw a little control volume here, and I've got some Q flux coming in over here, some Q at X plus delta X coming out this way, and Q leak coming out the sides. And I'm just going to conserve mass. So if I conserve mass, I get something that looks like this, right? So Q minus Q leak is equal to H times uh, dQ dx. Everybody can convince themselves that that's correct. Um, the next thing I need to do is I need to say, okay, um, I haven't said yet how hard it is to push fluid out through this thing over here, okay? And how hard it is to push fluid out through that thing over there um, is gonna depend on um, that permeability K, and it's gonna relate sort of the pressure inside that box. So here's the pressure inside that box to the permeability K. Um, and um, we, we use something, this is uh, well-established, which is Darcy's law. And Darcy's law basically says that the flux through that wall um, is proportional to the pressure difference across the wall, um, and also proportional to K, the permeability, how hard it is to push stuff through, um, and also uh, inversely proportional to L, the thickness of that thing. And, um, and now I just combine those two guys and I get this nice differential equation. Um, so, uh, so now I have two, uh, my two unknowns here are Q, my flux down the pipe, and my uh, P, the pressure inside the pipe. So I need one more equation to close the system. And uh, the last equation I'm going to do to close the system is I'm going to conserve momentum in this, uh, in this box. Okay. So I'm going to conserve momentum. So uh, that I just copied that from the previous page. Um, here's conserving momentum. So when you conserve momentum, again, you can make some choices about what kinds of flow, what kind of flow this is, whether this is viscously dominated flow, whether this is tur turbulent flow. I'm again going to do the easiest possible one just because it makes the math easy, but I'm going to prove to you on the next slide that we can do something harder, right? But I won't go through all, all the algebra. Okay. Um, so again, uh, if I just uh, conserve momentum, this is conservation of momentum. This is literally the same equation you saw on the first slide. Um, and again, if I integrate this over my pipe, I get some, some flux. Um, and now I'm good to go, right? So I just take that Q and I plug it in that Q and I get a second order differential equation for P, which I can solve and I solve it. And once I know P, then from my Darcy's law on the previous slide, I can just plug that in and I get QL. And remember my whole goal here is to find Q leak. Okay, so that gets me to Q leak. Okay, so I do this, so I just plug that in, I solve for P, P goes down there. Um, and then I plug that in Darcy's law, that gives me Q leak. I now have everything I need um, except that there's this mystery parameter lambda here. Okay, and so lambda, lambda you can you can see by looking at this is an inverse length scale, and lambda depends on k by permeability. Okay, I don't know how k relates to the geometry of my of my manta yet. Um, H and L, so some other geometric parameters. Okay, so the last thing is to find k. Um, I'm now going to just copy this equation onto the next slide. I'm going to copy QL. So QL is my Q leak. I'm going to copy that over. Um, that's exactly what I had on the previous slide. And remember in my, my Manta thing where I'm trying to find that blue box. So in that blue box, um, I had uh, a normalized QL on this axis and my particle size on this axis. Okay, so I need to normalize my QL to make this to match that. Okay, so my normalized QL is this. I just divide that by the channel thing. That's fine. You can solve for that. Um, and again, I still have my, my sort of my K in here. Um, but the other thing I can do is I can now go back to my Darcy's law, which says that the flow through each of these little channel things here um, is proportional to my pressure difference across there. Um, and you can also say that in each of these, I can think of these as little pipes. In each of these little pipes, I've got some 
little um, parabolic flow. I, again, I have laminar flow in these little pipes, and that's something that's known, right? You can you can write down what the, what that is, and flow in those little pipes looks like this. It's the pressure difference here. That's the pressure from here to here. Um, it depends on d cubed, the diameter of that pipe, right? So it depends on d to a high power. Uh, 12, the 12 comes out of this. You see 12 all the time in, in these low Reynolds number flows. Uh, L is this length, and T is the periodicity of, of, my, of my little holes. Okay, so I, that's my Q-leak. I could write that just in terms of the parameters of the pore. Um, that has to be equal to this through Darcy's law, and so I can now just solve for K, right? So my, my pressures cancel, I solve for K, and I get K looks like D cubed over 12T. Okay, so it's just algebra, so I just do that. And, um, and now I take that K and I plug it in down here into my QL over Q channel. And remember, that's what I wanted, is I wanted my normalized Q-leak um, and I get the following. Okay, so this is my, this is this beautiful relationship. This is now my normalized Q leak. That was my vertical axis that I wanted. Okay. And uh, over here, this depends on the diameter of the pores, the length of the pores, H is the size of the channel, which is basically the size of the mantis mouth, right? Because my, cha my channel, I'm doing this, right? That's what my mantis. Um, and this here, this is just a fancy way to write the number of pores. So X is the distance down the manta, L is the total length of mantis, and this is the periodicity of the pore. So this is just the, the pore number right there. Okay, so in a minute, we are gonna check if that's true. Um, before I do that, I'm gonna tell you that even though I can write this like in a few equations on these slides for the 2D laminar case, um, we can go crazy, we can do whatever you want, right? We can do 3D laminar, we can go 2D turbulent, we can probably do 3D turbulent, although I didn't put that on the slide, but you can do all of these things analytically. So we do that um, again, just to just to let you know we can. Um, but let me let me first do this. So I'm now going to go back. And so Jin Yu, he you know you derive this, and now he says he has all of those simulations that I showed you on that plot before, all those little blue and red stars in that in that gap. Um, so we can measure this on all for all of those little points, um, and we can put that, and we can check to see if this relationship is really true. Okay, so I'm now going to check if Q leak over Q channel scales like d cubed over. Uh, L uh, over L, and it's amazing, it does. Look, there's no fitting parameters in this, right? There's no fitting parameters in this. So this is this is my normalized Q leakage, that's what we just solved for. This is D cubed over L, it's exactly what we said. So it works, it works beautifully. Um, and in fact, it works really beautifully um, until it does not work at all. <laughs> okay, so now my, so, so what we have so far now is that I've got that, so that QL, again, the thing I'm trying to get, I've got that QL, it's done. Like if I have small pores, it's good. We got it. It's exactly what we've done. Okay, but what happens is my pores get larger. Um, so, um, so we're going to dig in a little bit to understand why this thing goes off the rails when my pores get larger. And um, uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a picture of the simulation. So a picture of the simulation of someplace where it's working and where it's not working. So, um, so here's the picture of the simulation where it's working. That's what I showed you before. I've got that beautiful pore. I've got those beautiful streamlines, this lovely pressure gradient. Okay. Now I'm going to dial up the spacing on the pores. Um, and what you get um, is instead is you get something, oh, and again, pore and channel, uh, you get something that looks like this. Ah, so now instead of having that really nice parabolic flow in this channel, I get this vortex that's just sitting at the top of my pore. Okay, so why is there a vortex sitting at the top of the pore? You can ask, under what conditions am I going to get that vortex? And you can see it in the pressure contours here, right? Here are my pressure contours. So these are lines of constant pressure. Um, and so it's going to, so the, these kind of lines of constant pressure are going to push flow this way. Over here, if I look at, look at which way my lines of constant pressure are going, it's pushing flow that way, right? Um, and the reason it's doing that, um, so here I've got stuff flowing this way, um, is that there is a uh, stagnation point. And so a stagnation point, this is this point right here where the fluid hits the wall, right there, that little guy right there. And so it has to split and go in two directions. Um, and so you can get very high pressures at these stagnation points, depending on the parameters in the problem. And so if I set this up so that I have a high pressure at that stagnation point, and that pressure is higher than my pore pressure or higher than my channel pressure, it's gonna drive this vortex. Okay, so now my, my problem has become, um, under what conditions do I get a high stagnation point pressure um, in, this, uh, in this geometry? Okay, okay. so under what conditions do I get that pressure? So the first thing we did is we just plotted it. So here's what it looks like. 
Um, this is uh, this is the ratio of the stagnation pressure to the pore pressure on this axis on this one. This is the ratio of the stagnation pressure to the channel pressure, right? And I'm looking for cases, so I expect to see the vortex where my stagnation pressure is high. Okay, so over here, if I'm looking below here, so stagnation pressure is high there, pore pressure is high here. So uh, down here, this is where my pore pressure is high, and that's where everything works. Right, so everything works so far when I just have nice flow down the pore. Um, over here, if I go over here, this is where um, my stagnation pressure just dominates everything, channel pressure, pore pressure, and so that's where I expect to see the vortex, and in between there's some kind of transition. Okay. Um, I'm now just going to, I'm just going to rearrange these and color them. That's the same plot I showed you before. And again, my, the thing that I'm trying to figure out here is, again, my Q leak. Okay, so I'm now going to think about what does the parameter space look like where I have Q leak, Q leak, and now I'm going to think about this. I can put whatever I want on that other axis, but I'm going to do, I'm going to stick with this and say this is my channel velocity. Okay, and the channel, remember, the channel velocity is basically the manta swimming velocity, right? Because the channel is the mouth and the manta is doing this. And so whatever, that's the speed at which the water is coming through the manta. Okay. All right, so what I expect is something like this. Okay, this is just a sketch, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to convince you in a little bit that this sketch may be correct. So this tells you, this plot over here tells you, well, this transition between the sort of a transition regime and a vortex happens at some critical velocity, right, Q in. Okay, so that means I'm going to go over here, my average channel velocity, there's some critical velocity above which I get a vortex. Okay, below here, it's kind of a mess. Like if I look at that, there's no critical velocity at which this thing transitions, there's no critical diameter, which is transition. So there's some, there's some transition line that, that, uh, that, that, that transitions between the pore and the transition. And so now I can just do a bunch of experiments or I can do a bunch of measurements and I can fill in this, this plot. And what I expect to see is pore behavior over here, vortex behavior over here, and a big mess up there in the transition regime. Okay, okay. so the pore flow, um, that's done, right? Because that's the one we just showed you. That's, this is where all of our scaling works. This should work in the, in, the, in the pore regime. So anything here, I expect my Q leak to be, if I put this Q channel over here, I think Q leak to be linearly proportional to Q channel and depend on whatever I use for my, my DQs and my Ls. Okay, that's done. Um, so before I put in the points, um, let's think about what we would expect to see in the vortex regime. Okay, so the vortex regime, uh, the vortex regime is coming about because I get that high point at the stagnation point. Uh, has anybody here seen stagnation points before? Yes? No? Maybe? Kind of? <laughs> Pet you, raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's good. <laughs> okay. So, so, the stag so stagnation points, they look like this, right? Um, this is what the flow fields look like. And there is a beautiful theory around stagnation points um, done by Jimenez in, from 1911. Um, and it's a similarity solution. So the way this works um, is that you, you make an ansatz that in the far field, uh, these flow lines look like this, right? So, which is basically a hyperbolic shape. So it's do so that on that is doing this, um, and then also that in the near field, um, you have to satisfy a no slip condition of this boundary, and so you get this this sort of boundary layer, right? So this is giving you the connection of the far field to that near field boundary layer, okay? And you make this ansatz, and you just plug it into the conservation of momentum and the conservation of math uh, of mass, and you turn the crank. And you turn the crank, and um, and by the way, this is the this is the similarity variable. So this is the, this is the the scale distance from this wall is what that similarity variable is. Okay, um, you turn the crank, and um, what comes out of this? And by the way, anybody teaching fluid mechanics should do this similarity solution because it's re it's really nice. Um, and you get the following: um, you get that the pressure uh, scale, the pressure is well is equal to. Um, x, so it's close like x squared, which is your distance from this point, so this is x squared in this direction, um, plus these terms which have these funny f's in them, and the f's, the f's are just the solution to this differential equation, which has been solved, um, and uh, to the point where like this, page, this picture is from Wikipedia, like you go to Wikipedia and that's the answer to that equation, <laughs> okay, so that's known, and so these are the, that's the shape, so f is some known function, 
Um, and then this gives you the, the pressure field. And once you have the pressure field, you can go back and also get the, the flow fields. Okay. So that's the that's the, the, the known stagnation point similarity solution. And we can ask, uh, does this actually look like our stagnation point? Because ours is not quite like this, right? We're, we're not going into this nice clean far field, right? We're hit, hitting up against the next pore and there's all kinds of, there's that, that vortex going on. So there's a lot of stuff going on, but near, the, near that stagnation point, which is what I care about, right? I care about what is the pressure at that stagnation point. Um, it's pretty good. So this here is um, the, the Himan theory is underneath this. You can't even see it. There's kind of a dashed line underneath it. So it sits exactly, it's exactly right for the velocity field. Um, for the pressure, um, it's good at the right near where the stagnation point happens and then further away it peels off because we've got that, that vortex. But it's pretty, it's pretty good in the vicinity of the stagnation. Um, okay, so if we decide if we decide that this is an okay way to estimate the pressure, um, uh, we can. The next thing to do is to say, um, all right, what again? Q leak. This is all about finding Q leak, right? So here's my here's my vortex, right? Here's my vortex over here. Q leak is now. Now most of this flow is being caught up in this vortex. So Q leak, the stuff that's actually coming out this pore is the stuff that's coming in this little chunk down here, and then it comes out like this, and then it just comes out the bottom. Okay. All right, so I've got Q leak. And so Q leak is basically, I have to integrate the velocity across this from zero to Y star. Okay, so I'm integrating that velocity from zero to Y star. Okay, fine, I just write that down. And now I'm going to rescale this according to the um, Hyman's um, uh, stagnation point theory. Okay, so I do that, I rescale that. And I find that I get this prefactor that comes out in front of this integral. And this integral is just a number, right? F is known, A star is known, that's that gap. So this is just, this is 0.925. I don't know what it is. It's some number, right? And so this is the scaling, okay? That scaling now um, tells me that K, so what is K? K tells me something about the scale of the velocity in the far field. What is the velocity in the far field of this? Well, it's the channel velocity. It's how fast the manta is swimming. Right, that's the far field velocity. So K scales like the channel velocity, which tells me that QL scales like K to the one half, which means it must scale like the channel velocity of the one. Okay. Okay, so this is great. So I now have a prediction. I now have a prediction for you on how QL scales with the channel velocity. And that was exactly the plot I had before, right? I had QL on this axis, I had channel velocity, scale like one half. Okay, there's one thing you should now be look, staring at this going, you have a problem. Okay. And the problem is that there's nothing about the geometry of the filter in here. It doesn't depend on the width of the filter. It doesn't depend on the thickness of the filter. It doesn't depend on the angle. It doesn't depend on any of those things. It just says, I don't care what the geometry of your filter is. It's just going to scale like u to the one half. So somehow in all of this, I have now lost um, what the details of the pore are. Within, within this parameter ring that's re relevant to the manta, which is when I've got that vortex sitting there, okay? So what this is telling me is either this is either we've screwed something up, or when I make that plot, everything should collapse onto one line with a slope of one half um, when I'm in the vortex regime, okay? So here's the, here's the plot, okay? I'm now gonna put, so, so my claim now is if that is correct, Everything should collapse on a one line over here with a slope of one half, if that analysis was correct. And down here, I should have a bunch of lines of slope of one, which is what I showed you in the, in the previous analysis. Okay. All right. So we do that. Here's what you get. Amazing. <laughs> it all collapses on a slope of one half. Right. So, it, it's how, so, okay, this is great. We understand the fluid mechanics. This is terrible if you want to design something because your design does not matter. <laughs> it does not matter if you're, in, the, if you're in, this, in this regime. It does matter if you're down here, which is great. So we can design over here, but over here, it just does not matter. Um, okay. And by the way, there's two lines here because um, so... Uh, so you notice in the in the simulation, I've got things that are kind of at angles, and in my analysis, I just had everything kind of vertical. Turns out the it, the angle dependence is very weak, which is why I I pulled that out. You can put it in, you can put it in the analysis, but um, if you so one of these is forward facing, one of those backward facing. So they're they're close, but um, they're not exactly the same, but they're close. Okay. So, um, so fine. So we have this. So this seems good. Um, and now you, you say, well, you know, but this was all like done in 2D, right? There's a lot of 
approximations here? Is this really what you're going to see in the experiment? So we did the experiment. Okay, so here's the experiment. Um, so uh, this is our this is our tabletop manta. So that's the manta. Um, the the middle channel there is of course the mouth is on that end, and these are the little filters on this end, and we can collect stuff coming out of those pipes. Um, the first thing you might ask is, uh, does our basic assumption hold um, that we really have tiny particles going in and big particles bouncing off the tops and going down the going down the the channel? Um, so the first time the thing you can do is you can just dump in a bunch of different particle sizes into a long term exposure, um, and you get this. Amazing! It's really, literally doing exactly what it should be doing. Okay, so that seems to be working. It, it is putting, like, there's a critical particle size that goes through here, and the rest go down the, down the pipe. Um, you can also look for the for the vortices, right? So here's the vortices. So at um, uh, at sort of low flow rates, or or the equivalent is small uh, small gaps, you get something that's um, laminar. This is now. I don't know if you get. This is really hard to see. There's kind. Of, I need to find a better way to color this. But there's a vortex there. I don't know if you can kind of see that. There's a vortex there. Maybe you can kind of see that. And, th and then this is the transition regime, which is a mess. Okay. Um, but really, uh, really what you want to know is, um, does this work? Okay. So this is our prediction. Um, I'm not going to put the experiment plot on this because this is 2D, right? And so 2D, this is the, like the units on this is um, like, it's a length per time. Uh, sorry, it's a length. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a length. Actually, I guess it's a it's a length per time, and this is going to be a length squared per time on this one. Okay, so the units aren't even the same, so I can't put them on the same plot. Um, but uh, we can measure it, right? We can measure Q leak. We can measure that we can change the channel velocity. We can change the pore sizes and all that kind of stuff. And when you do that, um, here's what you get in the experiment. Exactly true. It's amazing, right? So all of the one halves they collapse in the vortex regime. The here down here, I get this nice scaling of one. That is with the forward facing or maybe the backward facing slits. I'm not quite sure. Here's if you turn them around, go the other way. So again, same thing. Um, you could also say, okay, well, um, we did these two D nice two D simulations on ANSYS. I can also do the three D simulations. So if you do the three D simulations, um, they sit here. They're not quite on top of this. Like if this was perfect, these squares would be sitting on top of these guys here. So, um, but they're, you know, they're sort of close. Um, then you can also say, okay, um, I can also do my analytic results, which should work in the poor regime. Um, and so my analytic results, if you put those in the poor regime, they sit here. So, um, so this line here, this line here should be um, describing uh, these guys here, this, these guys here, and these guys here. Right? So this is the this is the smallest pore. Um, this is now the next largest pore, which is that guy over there. Um, this one is pretty far off because this is supposed to be matching this line over here. Um, and I think so. There's a number of reasons why it might be off, um, but I think the real reason it's off is that our uh, lab manta is not submerged. Right, so the stuff that's flowing out, it's actually flowing out into air, which means that there's a hydrostatic pressure, that it, an additional hydrostatic pressure, which is driving flow. Um, and the real manta is submerged. So if I was actually going to ask which one of these is more um, indicative of the real manta, I would actually pick the analytic solution over the, over the experiment. Because um, the experiment, again, is not, not quite the real manta. Um, okay, so we're almost there now. So now I, I think we... We understand, we understand what's going on in the system. We understand where the vortices are. We understand where the mantis sits. We understand the analytic solutions. We understand the numerical solutions. And so the last thing is to say, okay, um, does it, can we use this to rationalize the size of those little platelets that we found in the manta? That was the original question I asked you. Why are these plates the same in, all, in the manta? Okay, so, um, so here is the, there's the manta, just to remind you. Um, so here's, here's the picture that I showed you before. So we can now convert between our Ds, our gaps over there, and the Ls into my Q leaks. Okay. So I can now convert all those sizes of the mantas and put them on this chart. Um, and what you might expect is, um, so first of all, again, we want to kind of be up towards that corner. That was the, that was the objective. So you expect the manta to be kind of on the upper edge of, this, of those guys. Similarly, you probably don't want it to be too high because if I was, I can't reach this, but you see, if, you're, um, if you're, your Q leak is up there by 10 to the minus two, then I'm only getting that tiny region of, of plankton, whereas I kind of want to be in one of this, in this fat region, right? So I want to be kind of maybe around 10 to the minus three. 
somewhere in there. So I get that whole range of juicy plankton. Yes? Okay, so if you do that, so that tells you, you kind of expect your mantis to, let's get, can use my, my, yeah, so you kind of expect your mantis to sit sort of right around here, right? If they really are trying to do these two things, okay? So Jin Yu went into the literature, he looked up platelets for a bunch of different mantas, and they sit right there. <laughs> They're bang on. <laughs> It's great. So these are two particular mantis species over here. These are a bunch of other different species. We, did, we didn't make them all, all the points mantis shaped because they would all stack on top of each other and you couldn't tell, but there's two mantis over there. Um, similarly, um, I can also map this instead of doing this on a particle cough and a, and a leaky um, axis, I can also do this in terms of a design space. So I can think about the design space. Um, so here's my design space, which would be um, this is, so this would be like the geometry to the four. So this is four aspect ratio and four widths. And from this, I can predict um, like what are the cutoff particle diameters and what are the, the flow rates that you would expect through, the, through this. Um, these two dark red lines are kind of the boundaries you would expect for the mantis. So the mantis could sit somewhere in here. And, um, and this is in fact where the mantis sit. It's, it's, it's basically the same as what we showed you on the previous plot, but just visualized in a different way. And this is useful if you now want to actually um, uh, make something for Deer Island, right? Because you can pick one of these, um, one of, um, uh, you can pick basically these contours and say, what are the contours that I need in order to get the filtration that I want? And then you just read off of this plot, what is the length of my pore and the pore width that I need in order to get that kind of behavior? So um, that is uh, the end of my Manda story. I'm going to end with um, the most important slide, which is this one. Uh, so Jin Yu Mao is the graduate student um, who did all of this work, who's uh, just been a powerhouse throughout all of this. Um, and Ermgard Bischofberger, um, my colleague, who has also been our collaborator in this, and I just wanted to put this picture up to show you how gigantic these things really are. Um, and I will thank you for your attention. Questions? On the last slide, um, it looked like there was a lot more variation in the diameter. Is there a reason? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this one, um, uh, so you, you picked out something that I am, um, so, so let me, actually, let me go, let me go to this right. one. On, on, on. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I, I think that's exactly right. And I think we are being a little bit too generous in the range of sizes for the for the plankton. So if, if you look at those the planktons that I showed, like uh, a millimeter is pretty big for plankton, like maybe if you're getting krill or something. So I would actually have cut this off a little bit sooner. So I think, I, I, so I, I agree with you. Um, so I think that this range is, um, I think we're being generous to plankton with that range. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think you have, we have to make a call on where, where we cut it off. So. Yeah. When you actually look at uh, the pores of the manta ray, yeah. um, in your analysis, I think it's all regular spacing, but do they have a heterogeneous uh, spacing? Yeah, great. Yeah, so actually, let's look at it. Um, so, uh, it's a terrific question. Um, I, you know, we typically see pictures sort of like this, so it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, I have not seen, okay, so first let me say this. Um, but for, biologists have measured everything. <laughs> I'm sure there's a biologist that's measured this. <laughs> um, I, do not have the, I do not have the number because you're absolutely right. It would actually be nice to get not only kind of like the, the, the spacing, the mean spacing, but also the variance. And I don't, know, I don't know what the variance is. I haven't found that number yet. Because yeah. I think depending on a filtration system that you're making, you actually might want a irregular uh, pattern. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's okay. So I, actually, you, you hit on one of my favorite topics right now, <laughs> which is it's, which is that in all of these models that, that we do, we tend to we tend to pick um, sort of we tend to pick a parameter. We tend to pick values for our parameter that are based on the mean of, of observations. And I think so. First of all, I'm amazed by how well that works because <laughs> a lot of these things there is a lot of variance. Um, and so I, one of the things I, I was thinking about um, in some of my conversations this morning is. Um, so first, why is it that the mean actually works in a lot of these things? And when does it not? Um, so I, I, I actually, and especially we're now starting to think about human systems where there's a lot of variance in those and the shape of that distribution, I, I can't imagine that the shape of that distribution doesn't matter 
So, um, so the answer to your question is I don't know, but I think it's super interesting. <laughs> yeah. You thought about both in the context of the Manta and in Deer Island yeah. about kind of energetics of this, because there's kind of an interesting question, like for the Manta, swims faster, but it takes more energy, can swim yeah. slow, they steer night hypoxia. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Uh, terrific question. And I, um, so we, we, we actually looked at the energetics on this and um, I'm not going to remember exactly, but I, I, but it also depends on the density of the, of food, right? So they only do this behavior when you're going through like really rich planktony water. And I think if you're not going through that, you do something that is much more energy efficient. You're just gliding. Um, so, and I can't remember, and I think, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think we did find that if you are not going through an energy rich patch, it's not worth it, right? So I think they are they are kind of act they are operating right at this kind of boundary where um, where it's worth it to turn it on when you get enough plankton. And if you don't get enough plankton, then you're in trouble, with your Amanda. Um, and totally, totally also uh, agree with the Deer Island that the 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 big question there is the energetics. It's how big of a pump do you need? Yeah. Um, I will also say that there are systems that use cross flow filtration. Um, and so people, so basically what they do is they take their filters and you roll them into a spiral. Um, and so the, and then you flow the, the air or the fluid through the spiral and then it goes out the, the sides and is collected kind of into the, in the middle of this, of this thing. Um, in fact, I think it's like, it's, it's like dirty water, filter, clean water, and then that clean water, uh, and then dirty water, filter, clean water, right? Um, and I think the, um, so people have used this, but I don't think they've done this analysis to figure out how you should actually design the pores to get the, the kinds of, I think they just measure it and say what, what comes out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, yeah. Very nice talk. Uh, nice analysis. I just wondered what, I, maybe I missed, what's the assumption on the large particles going, not going into the pore and the small particles going into the pore? Is that based on the, deflection of the particle when it hits the that upper edge of the pore? Yeah, this is a great... So you have an assumption yeah. that, that the yeah. particles are uniformly yeah. distributed. It's, yeah, this is this is a great question. So what we, we did something much simpler, and we just looked at the background streamline. And we just said, how close... If the particle is a passive object, how close does that particle get to the... get to the... whatever, that little sticky outie. Um The real way to do this, and we've we've... We've started to do this analysis is to say that I, I've got this sort of rigid piece and I've got a particle coming towards it. And when the particle comes towards it, there's a lubrication layer between it. And you actually have to solve that lubrication layer in order to understand how this particle bounces off back into the flow. So, um, so what we've done is I would say a, a, a reasonable estimate, but it's it's not going to be quite right. Um, you know, to within to within what we can measure on the Manta, it's fine. But if you were really going to design this for Deer Island, you have to get that. Um, that lubrication piece um, done. Oh, and by the way, this is this is actually a really good question, which I will I will say to the graduate students. So, I asked my I I told I told Jin Yu I said um, uh, um, uh, surely this has been done a particle interacting with the cylinder. We know what the lubrication forces must be. Mm -hmm. And he looked and he couldn't find it. I said okay, this must have been done. He looked and he couldn't find it. And Jin Yu is very very good. So I mean he looked hard. He could not find it. And so finally, we gave up and he said, okay, I'm, I'll do it. And he did this absolutely gorgeous analysis of, of the particle uh, coming up into the, the cylinder. And right after he'd finished the analysis, he found the reference from like an exactly, which did it exactly the way he did it, which is so, so, uh, so it was, it was, gr it was great that he did the analysis. And, um, uh, you know, honestly, I kind of wanted him to do the analysis anyway, but um, it looked super hard for the references. And this was buried. This was really buried. It was hard to find. Other questions? Yeah. What about non-passive scalars? So if you take density into effect, then it works better, I assume, or? Oh, uh, you mean density, mean, you mean non-neutrally non buoyant particles? Exactly. So when they yeah. have to make that corner, they're going to keep going or? Oh, yeah. So, oh, so you have some inertia in the particles. Right. And that yeah. might be true for, you know, I don't know about algae, but maybe for Deer Island again. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, no, that's a great point. And I think this one, so this is not the analysis that we did, but this is the one that this previous group did, um, I think they actually have inertia in their particles on this one. I think they did They did F equals MA. This is not a, a, a fluids group, um, but I, I, from what I can tell, I think they actually did this pretty well. And they have, um, 
they they do have inertia in their particles. And again, they don't do the lubrication interaction with this. They just have them bouncing. Yeah. It'd just be curious because algae, I know, are close to density match, but yeah. they all fall to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. And right along that yeah. stagnation point, it might be really sensitive yeah. to tiny density difference. Actually, that's interesting. And I do wonder, because the other thing that we don't have in this is we haven't, we, I don't know why they do this when they're feeding, right? I, sh I showed you they do this big backflip when they're feeding. And so I don't know why you would do that, but it does change the direction of gravity. So <laughs> I don't or know if that's- Or the Yeah, or, or, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, um, so I, I think that would actually be a really interesting piece to, to add. Any questions? Would you entertain a, a lay person? Oh, question? yes, absolutely. So yeah. I guess you talked about one four, but yeah. is there any variability in the number of four? Yes, yes. Okay, good lay person question. So, <laughs> so one of the things, one of the things that we did is so we, we did talk about this analysis of one four. And um, let's see if I can put up a four picture. Um, so what really happens here is since stuff is leaked, so all of this analysis has been done in the limit of kind of small leakiness. Right, because if you don't have small leakiness, then that um, uh, your the, the flow out of these pores is very different than the flow out of these pores because I've already lost a bunch of the fluid, right? So the fluid has to come out faster from these than, than from these. And so the analysis that we do is fun. We can get the variation, but only if it's gradual, um, which may or may not be actually true for the manta rays. Um, what's actually even more interesting is that if you look at the manta ray, um, and this is something, um, Howard Stone is visiting this, this semester and he pointed this out, which is exactly the right, uh, it's Howard, so it's exactly the right question to ask. If you look through here, this, 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 this sort of gap is not a uniform gap, it's actually converging. And if you have a gap that's converging, then that could actually um, uh, balance the fact that you have, um, that you're losing flow out the beginning, right? So you can actually get into more of a steady state um, thing where everything is constant along the, the profile. So that's what my student is currently doing. He's now doing the converging channel to see if all of the pores are equivalent because they're not equivalent in the current analysis. Great. Great. Well, that's great. No more thank questions. You. Well, let's thank you.